Okay, this is one of those <coughs> passages where I think sometimes it's really hard to, to differentiate, at least in the minds of some people, between things that happened in a, a very unique time period in the first century when God and Jesus were authorizing or had authorized with the guidance of the Holy Spirit the establishment of his church. And along with that came various uh, miraculous powers. And while you can read this and not not necessarily think that it's speaking about the miraculous, but when, when he says things like, um, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, the, the, the apostles spoke with great, great authority. And, and then when he says, if any, of, if any two of you agree, it shall be done. So how do we, how do we translate the, the or how do we, uh, how do we go from the first century to the 21st century when we read this? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and this was a miraculous time. Uh, and these were apostles who had authority and the power of the Holy Spirit. And they could, the Holy Spirit was revealing things to them. So in that sense, they could bind things on earth and on heaven. I don't think that gives us that ability. You know, the, the Catholic Church would read that and they would assign that as the oh, yeah. powers of the priesthood or powers of certain ones to remiss or remove or forgive <coughs> sin. You know, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, if you say it's forgiven, it's forgiven. That, I guess that's one way to interpret it, but we've uh, traditionally, we have uh, take an issue with that, you know, that, that's not, that may, may have been what power was given to the apostles in the first century, but 2,000 years later, it's not the same as what is given now to the priesthood of all believers. They're, they're, I, I'm just saying we can't rule out the, the uh, miraculous aspect of this if we're to grasp it. What comes into my mind is when, when Jesus told the apostles, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, we lose in heaven. The same, using the same words. In that, he's talking to them. Now, I know in the Catholic Church, I hate just constantly getting on the Catholics here, but the Catholic Church said each successive pope was handed that set of keys, that Peter was the first pope, and that Christ gave Peter specifically and solely those keys, and that each pope had those keys so that they had the power to change or bind anything they wanted. And how do you explain this away? How do you explain to a Catholic this means the first century and what you're thinking is wrong? How do, how do you explain that to them? Or how do you prove or how do you make them see your way? How do you argue? Well, I couldn't answer that in one sentence. I know that. Well, I'm asking yeah. one sentence. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably. No offense to Catholics, but most of them wouldn't be aware of the city because they don't study the Bible, so. You know, I used to be one, so. Yeah. But I'm saying generally, most Catholics don't study the Bible, they follow their tradition, you know, and what the, their but authorities tell. The thing that they do, do know, I mean, I'm, I personally have, and that's one verse, I mean, I'm saying they know that verse, but they know that concept, they believe that concept. Well, then you would, they go back to, to uh, the verse I talked about. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I, you know, that's right after he says, I name you Peter. You know, then you get into that, that. You look at the words. One is Peter, a stone. And the other one is what, Petrus, a great ledge of stone. Well, my husband, they, they do say the Bible. They have some Bible studies. He goes to sometimes on Monday nights. They can have these little things off the line. But they use the Bible. If they go back to what the Catholic Church teaches them. Because it says in the front of their Bible that whatever the, the Catholic Church rules is what the bottom line is. And I mean, the word of the Bible is like ours. Well, you know, I don't want to constantly belittle Catholics. I mean, we can look around. Yeah. We can even look at the church. 
churches of Christ on some issues. I'm, I'm not saying you did that. I'm just saying yeah. anybody's information. They are doing it more now. Some, yes, some they are. They are holding their Bibles. Um, James 5.14, this is something that uh, uh, I've been talking to David Black a little bit with lately. Um, you know, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them. Anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. It's a little different from today's. You know, was that for the first century to do? Um, you know, do we have the powers to do that today? Is it, is it worth doing today? And uh, I wonder, you know, if if I was sick or something like that, you know, it would still be, even though it's not the first century, it might still be nice to be done. You know, there might still be something to it. I don't know. Uh, well, that, that's part of where we have to uh, adjust our lens when we study some of this because we have to acknowledge that this is written to a first century, uh, in a first century context. And there were, there were unique things that were happening in that time period in terms of God giving miracles and stuff. But yet, if the Bible is still to be worthless for, uh, useless for us, we have to learn to extract from this without damaging the text, maybe deriving some principles. Just like the, the section that we weren't here last Wednesday, but evidently you've been talking about how, you know, if anyone sins against you, we can read that, and while we may not come up to the same conclusion about whatever you buy on earth shall be found in heaven, we can see there's great value, first of all, in knowing your brethren, you, you know, to the point where you would know if somebody had sinned against you or if you had sinned against them, but how do we work out the uh, practical and the same thing with that, you know, and, and I know our elders have uh, struggled if that's the right word, do, do they take uh, oil to, you know, should they take, uh, should they visit uh, Burnett, or should any of us, for that matter, visit Burnett and Charlene and uh, pray with Burnett, and would there be any value in anointing him with oil? You know, is there some kind of, uh, without intending that this be miraculous, you know, I, I, don't, I think our elders would be wrong if they got on their knees and prayed and said, Lord, you've empowered us to whatever we say. If two of us agree, it's going to be done. Uh, Vic and Brian and I agree you need to get rid of the, uh, Burnett's tumor immediately. If, I think that would be presumptuous for you men to do. But... Could there be something symbolic in the oil, something even cathartic in the oil? Um, I, I don't, I'm not saying necessarily that the oil is powerful or has value in and of itself, but the act, it was just the same as um, when these two got married, they anointed each other's feet or washed each other's feet. There, there's something symbolic about that. They didn't do it because their feet were dirty. They did it to express something, and maybe there's something behind the anointing with the oil that comes under that category. Well, it's the power of prayer, in my view, that would be efficacious. Yeah. But 18 and 19 is referring to discipline in the church, right? It's not concerning well, how to discipline. Well, so this all kind of flows. He's building on what he's saying here. You know, like when it talks about uh, if anybody sins against you, go see him bring to and bring him before the church. And then if he still doesn't respond to that, treat him as a tax gatherer or a Gentile. In other words, excommunicate him, so to speak. And then, he, and then right from that, he says, whatever you, you know, two or more agree on, it will be bound. Jesus saying that if you're all in agreement with this, it's, what it like. it's okay. Do you know the word, the, the Greek word in that verse for agree literally means to symphonize. Not synchronize, symphonize. 
sounds like a symphony. So is Jesus saying he wants all of us to be in agreement to where we're like an orchestra, fine tuned, playing together, making a beautiful sound? Insane. And then the verses after these we're going to be getting into, which is talking about forgiveness. Where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in your midst. Then he gets on in verse 21, you know, we all know the story that Peter, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? So Peter asked the question based on what Jesus just got done saying. So in Peter's mind, he's, he's starting to think about forgiveness. This person, I'm going to him and trying to reconcile our differences and reconcile him to me. But if it fails all the way through to where he's treated as a tax collector or a Gentile, does that mean I don't have to forgive that person or, or, or something along those lines? Then, you know, shall I forgive him up to seven times? Now, the tradition at that time the rabbis taught you, you can forgive somebody three times, and then that's it. Well, Peter, being a Jew, knows that, but then he says to Jesus, should I forgive him, forgive him seven times? So Peter is saying, you know, should I offer a greater amount of forgiveness than what's traditionally accepted, which is only three times? So Peter's like being, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, I'm <laughs> saying the right thing, and then Jesus says, not seven times, but seven times seven, or seventy times seven. And we all know, you know, multiply that and say, you know, keep a record of something. It just means you forgive. And then this whole story here, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to seventy times seven, for this reason, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain kingdom which to sell accounts which is these, and we just covered that in the sermon up to and when he had begun to settle him, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. Now I see all over the board how much 10,000 talents is. Anywhere from a million to a billion. All we know is it's a tremendous amount of money that ain't going to be able to pay back. But since he did not have the means to repay his Lord, commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children all that he had. Now when you sold a slave, all you got was a talent for selling the average slave. So the master wasn't gaining really any of his money back. But that's a major punishment. You're a slave. I'm going to sell you, your wife, your kids, and everything you've got. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll repay you everything. Right there, dude. There's no way. The master goes, There's no way. I want to know how that person got that far in debt to begin with. You know, but it, it, we, this is just a story, so we don't have to go in deeper to what it really is. And I'll repay you everything. Yeah, sure you will. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him of his debt. debt. So apparently, by his slave dropping down on his knees and and begging for him, you know, give me an opportunity, I'll do my best, I'll, I'll try to pay you back, you know, you, you, you're first on my list, or whatever. And, and the Lord had compassion on him. Now that's a lot of compassion. It ain't like, hey, you owe me 20 bucks, don't worry about it. I mean, this is a tremendous amount of money here. But the slave, and then he turns around, this, this just shows me how human nature never really changes. This is an old story, but I can see this happening over and over again. I like watching Judge Judy <laughs> and Judge Alex, and, and, and you see this kind of thing all the time. And the Lord of the slaves, okay, 28, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Denarii, that's, I guess, uh, he was, uh, oh, no, that's so many days' wages there. A denarii, I think, was one day's wage, and uh, so that's a hundred days wage. So he's probably getting minimum wage, by the way. But anyway, 
And he seized him and began to choke him. He just got forgiven something he knew there was no way he could possibly pay back. And he's almost ended up in slavery, sold off to whoever for the rest of his life, which is probably worse than just sitting around in a prison. Well, I can't say that. And then he goes out and he finds his buddy, a fellow slave. Hey, man, you owe me a hundred to there. He grabs him around the neck. Give me that money, man. So he began to choke him, pay back what you owe me. So his fellow slave fell down and began to treat him, saying, in other words, he's doing the same thing to him. Have patience with me and I'll repay you. Now it is possible that he could have repaid that debt a hundred days. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. That always bothered me as first. He threw him in prison until he could pay back. Well, if you're in prison, how are you going to have money to pay back? Unless he had money stashed away. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. So I wonder if these other fellow slaves knew that the master had forgiven him of a huge debt. And they said, well, okay, the master forgave this guy, Bills. Look what he's doing to this poor guy. I'm going to tell him. Where there's so much uh, in this stuff. Yeah. You know, the, the backdrop of it, you have to see that it's uh, God has forgiven us. And our debt, you know, like we're saying, it's a debt we could never pay. And He's been so gracious and so merciful to forgive us our debt. And yet, here we are as fellow servants holding grudges or holding each other um, bad attitudes towards one another for some wrong, <laughs> some minor wrong that doesn't yeah. hold a candle to all that God has forgiven us. It's, and and, and maybe uh, on a, a fuller uh, picture here, you wonder if everybody in the church doesn't see you know, what, what right does Keith have to be better out of shape with God when God has been so, you know, I mean, the, the point is the other slaves know it. Everybody knows it. Yeah. None of us has a right to get our nose in a joint because somebody else has wronged us and mistreated us. You know, that's the whole story. Yeah. Was that going back to the church discipline <coughs> about the church not forgiving somebody? Like, you know, you bring them before the whole church, you know, be careful about not forgiving them. You remember, you know, Jesus is forgiving, I mean, God's forgiving you of your multiple of sins. So when you come together as a church, be careful about not forgiving that one person and treating them like a heathen because... Well, if that person is unrepentant, then they're moved out. Even though someone is unrepentant, you can forgive them of their sin. But until they turn from their sin and, and repent, then they're held out. But I think he's still saying, you still need to forgive this person. Yeah, you still them. forgive them in your heart, but he still has to answer for them. Well, that very, uh, the but first this, story from Jesus is what provoked Peter to go to Jesus yeah. and say, Lord, how, how often? Yeah, and, he's, and, and he upped it from three, which was the given, to seven. But this second slave who owes just a denarius, he didn't pay it. I mean, he couldn't pay it back. It's not like he said, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back. I mean, he didn't pay him back. Just like whoever came before the church. I, mean, I don't know. It just seems like there's some connection between this church discipline and forgiveness. Well, I would say there is a connection in that we still have to be forgiving. Uh, it doesn't mean you okay and authorize. If, if I'm repentant, if I'm running around with women on Debbie and everybody you know, says, you know, you got, you're committing adultery, you got to stop it, and I refuse to do it, you know, they, I'm just the binding part, you know, how like whatever you bind on earth, you bound in heaven, and you have this forgiveness stuff where it just seems like there's a stronger connection between the two than just two very good stories about forgiveness. And well, yeah, I, I, I think they run together. I mean, it's a whole, the whole thing here. But the bottom line is, you know, when he's talking about forgiveness,
forgiveness in the story of what Terry was saying. It's the whole idea here is, and, and, and you find out at the end of this, uh, so when his fellows, see what they okay, 32, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even if I had mercy on you? His Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that he was owed. Now, to me, this is saying, what God is saying, I've forgiven you everything through the cross of my son. You accepted that forgiveness. I expect you to forgive in return. How could you not forgive someone and still want to accept your own forgiveness from the Lord. I feel like the older I've got, the more I, I can relate to um, the guy who was forgiven and then went and held him, the guy under him accountable. Uh, you know, if I had known, okay, that I was going to have a family and, and kids and, um, you know, and I, you know, so I've accrued a lot of student loans and stuff. And uh, if I went and was to the point where, you know, if, if the banks could act like they did then and they go, well, all right, you're now getting sold because of what you did. Your family's getting sold. I could see it being like, oh, I better wake up. I better have a wake up call here. Let me get my finances in order. I just got, my, my whole family was saved. I better get everybody underneath me in line so this never happens to me again or get sold. Like, that could be an easy slippery slope to be, to be caught in or... You're in church, and you understand about forgiveness. Okay, forgive everybody. But then you learn about God's holiness. Well, okay, so now we are we need it held accountable because of God's holiness. And now you have to reconcile forgiving everybody, yet, yet perfection. How do you reconcile this? It's definitely a human. This guy is not like some weirdo. It doesn't give us. It's, it's like pretty common yeah. that we don't want to forgive each other. So, I mean... And, and what can't be lost in the story is that you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. We sing it. But he had, a, he had a point. God has a point here where he just, he's not going to tolerate this. And he throws him in prison. You, you can read that now if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, Until he repays it, which he's going to do. So we can, we can thwart the grace of God and stir up his ire. You know, I, I think one of the things that our, the church of our generation slowly it's been uh, incremental. We've almost rewritten uh, the we want to emphasize the grace of God. Nobody's opposed to that. But we've almost taken the teeth out of God. And, and that connects with the, the holiness of God. There, there's a point at which God just can't wink at what we're doing, especially when we're intentional about it and repetitious about the sin that we're doing. So we, we, uh, We've got to teach a balanced grace that also does hold us accountable. Otherwise, we turn the grace of God into license to do whatever we want. And then you're claiming to be a Christian. And we talked the other <clears throat> just past Sunday morning about the light. God's word is the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. We, in turn, are the light. So how can we go out talking to people about God's offering you full, full forgiveness? But yet there are several people that I refuse to forgive. It's not always easy to forgive. I mean, let's face it. Most of us have run into a situation where we work with people where they can say whatever they want, but don't you ever say anything back to them? Oh. And this is what this guy's doing here. I can do it to you, but don't you do it to me. It's like... Anybody else? The last verse of 
from the head to the Yeah. Well, let's read it. Verse 35. Go ahead and read it. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from where? Your heart. That's the key. I'm not going to forgive you just because I said, well, let's see if one might
None of us were punished either for our sins. We, our punishment was the cross, but Christ took it for us. So he took our punishment. So we have to, we should all understand we deserve that punishment. We're the ones that should have been. But God and, and didn't punish him, didn't punish us. He punished his son. His son took the punishment in our place. So he was, for, he didn't have, we didn't have to go to jail. We were free from the jail of sin. <clears throat> You know, one of the great things about sessions like this is it's humbling, isn't it, when we come together and a, a passage of scripture that we've all read maybe multiple times. And we have it. We, we won't leave here tonight with definitive answers. You know, I don't know anybody's going to go home and say, yeah, boy, we got that all just right. We're, we're going to leave here still wondering about some of the applications of this and what, what does it really mean. But the value is, um, is not just in finding the right answer, but the explore, exploration of, of trying to find the answer and uh, the pooling our minds and hearts together to, to search the scriptures to, to try to understand these things. And, and it's something we we keep on doing, and, and we we can we could come to this text next year and come back and visit it again. And it wouldn't be that you know somebody could say, "Well, we studied that last year." Well, there's still things to be understood yeah. about it, and, and it's good to have it in the forefront. One of the great values, and um, and, and there's just one last note on that. And, and Maybe it's the bigger point. Um, we better not get the big head because we think we're good students. If, it, if anything, sessions like this ought to make us realize that we don't have it all figured out and that we are still students. And so we need to be uh, passionate and patient with one another. And I still care. I still, that brings me all the way back to when Deb and I was first studying the C.D. Beagle. The C.D. Beagle had the ability, he could speak to college professors at that level, and he could speak to Deb and I as newborn babes of Christ. And, and, and C.D. made it, you know, he was a preacher, he said, for 50-some years. He told me, he says, you know, I'm still learning. You know, and that always impressed me. <clears throat> we're still learning. You know, I look at these pages like doors. We're opening up a door, finding out what's inside. And you can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. I think, you know, uh, there's, it's in everybody. Uh, God gives through all these feelings. I think anger, we have to uh, learn to control that anger before we start to get it's uh, so many, it, there's a lot involved, that's all I can say. You know, and don't, don't we always forgive our kids? You know, do we, we need to forgive others the same way we always forgive our kids, even when they come home. You know, I don't like what you did, but I forgive you. It doesn't mean they don't get punished. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right.
That's a good comment to close on. I like we, we have to be humble. Anyone else? For another last word? That voice is cool. It's starting to sound like a computer. <laughs>
to your son, that we may repay part of that debt. Help us to forgive one another, help us to teach one another, and help us always to learn each and every day. Pray that you'll be with the sick of the congregation, healing them, restoring their health to them. We thank you for hearing our prayers and answering our prayers for the sick of the past year, returning so many of them to health. We pray that you may continue to do so. Pray for those who are in the military, those who are in the protective services and who are serving our country, that you'll watch over and keep them safe. We pray that you'll heal our nation of the deep divisions that exist among us politically, racially, religiously. We pray that we may work as Christians to solve these problems and lead lives and examples unto others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Excellent choice. Say what you said again. It's on the federal. They asked if I would. I said yes. I said yes. I know what you're saying. So now they're they've got a lot of work. Jack Herschel. So it could be. Yeah. All right.